This is the solution video for assignment number four, um, but because of the amount of detail for some of the questions and the length it will take to go over them, I am really only going to talk about number three and four in detail. Uh, one is on the page and it follows the same procedure as in lecture. Uh, in fact, the questions are pretty much identical to the two practice trees at the end of lecture uh, six, truth conditional meaning of sentences. So the process is the same. I'll just make some comments about it. I'll talk quickly about how to do two, um, but all of the answers are there. I'll go over three and four in detail. And then question five, I will leave as feedback on all of your assignments uh, since other instructors like to use the question and they don't like the answers to be out. Um, so uh, this might take a little bit longer to mark than other assignments. So uh, question five will not be on test two and everything else you can just check the answer key for in the meantime, but I'll still try to get all the uh, files back uh, before test two, but um, it might be a little bit closer than usual. Okay, so here's the tree for the first case of the ambiguous sentence where it is not the case is negating everything. Uh, so what we're doing is we're building up the syntactic tree node by node. What's important is that every single node uh, has, well, every single terminal node has a value. So make sure that every single word itself has some value. So Percy, married, Elizabeth is romantic and Percy. And even though these need values, and then every single node above them, so the VT, N2, uh, N1, VP1, S3, conj, N3, VP2, VI, S4, and so on, have both a rule, so uh, where it's getting its meaning from, and then the value itself. So for example, with the N1 here, uh, we know it's getting its meaning from its only daughter, Percy, so the rule is in this line here, Percy, and then the value is below. Or for example, with S3, here's the rule that says it's one if noun one is an element of VP1, and the value is it's one if Percy is an element of the set of X, such that X married E in V. So uh, the big thing here was that when we negate the conjunction, uh, the truth value changes to zero if P is an element of X such that X married Elizabeth in V, and P is an element of X such that X is romantic in V. So this looks like um, something uh, in set theory, like A intersection B complement, or in logic, something like not P and Q. So if we want to change this to one or true if and only if something, we have to apply De Morgan's law here. So if we do De Morgan's law, we get A complement or B complement, or we get not P or not Q. So uh, the thing here is that if we change it, uh, the operator itself and changes to or. So this is the only thing that happens here. So if we have, say, not happy and not sad, this changes to neither happy nor sad. So uh, we see the distribution of the negation and we see the change of the operator from and to or. And it's going to be the same idea here with our truth conditions. So in the second case, we just had not negating one of the sides, S2. So this is what we see with the pattern here. So instead of it being true if Percy is in the set of X such that X married Elizabeth, it's going to be true if Percy is not in the set of X such that X married Elizabeth. And then when we do our conjunction rule, Again, we're just taking the meaning from the daughters here. So uh, we don't have to do anything with negation in S1. We don't need to add any modification to the rules here. We're just doing conjunction on S2 and S4. That's what I've named S2 and S4 here. And we're just taking each piece by piece. So S2 says P is not an element of X such that X married Elizabeth. And S4 says P is an element of the set of X such that X is romantic in B. So you can take a look at the details for this on your own. If you, have, if you have any questions, of course, email me. I'm happy to go over this in an office hour appointment or uh, a private appointment with you. Okay, the next one was evaluating the truth of sentences and situations. So the first three were predicates. 
So we have to take a look and figure out for A, who is awake in each situation. So in V1, Mark is awake is true, which means the only person who is awake is Mark. So we say that V1, uh, Mark is awake. In V2, we take a look and we see, okay, Constance is awake. And we see that nobody else is awake, so Constance is the one awake here. Uh, in V3, we're just given the set straight up. So is awake, Mark and Constance, so we can just put this right into that. Uh, we won't talk about fears. Fears works the same way, but introduces Mark. This one is a little bit different. So in V1 and V3, there's no one doing any introducing. But in V2, introduces Mark. We see that Constance introduces Mark to Constance. So in this case, when we think about introduces, this is a ditransitive verb. Uh, X introduces Y to Z. But we know what the Y is. It's introducing Mark. So when we're asking, you know, what's the set of introduces Mark, we're looking for just pairs X, Z at that point because we know what Y is. We know it's Mark. So our set is going to contain pairs of X, Z. So who's introducing Mark to who? In this case, it's just Constance introducing Mark to Constance. So our set here for V2 is Constance, Constance. Uh, nobody else is introducing Mark to anyone else. Okay, uh, for D, E, F, G, and H, these are just truth values. So you go through each of them and figure out uh, whether each part is true or false, and then just apply them uh, as you would with truth tables. So Mark is awake or Miguel is filthy rich, and it is not the case that Constance fears Miguel. Uh, for V1, Mark is awake is true, so that's saying like one or, well, Miguel is filthy rich is false, and it is not the case that Constance fears Miguel, so this is zero, sorry, so one or zero and one, that's the same thing as saying one or zero, which just evaluates to one, so V1 is true. And we could do that for every single situation with every single sentence, and this is how we get our final results. If you want to see any of these explained in more detail, um, and you're not quite sure how to get it, again, uh, feel free to ask, but uh, the video would take a very long time if I went through these piece by piece. And this is very similar to what we did with truth tables, but again, if you have questions, uh, please ask. I can go over this in more detail. Okay, let's talk about three in some more detail. If we zoom in, okay, let's zoom in a little bit more. So this one, we're thinking about how we can do logic with more than just ones and zeros. So what we're told is that not alpha is just one minus alpha. So now we can use any number and we can get a value from minus alpha. If we have alpha and beta, we're just gonna take the lowest value of alpha and beta. If we have alpha or beta, we're gonna take the highest value of alpha and beta. And that's just gonna give us new ways to calculate these. So let's just show that these work. So the first thing is find not p when p is zero. And we want to show that this is just the same thing as our regular propositional logic. We just have ones and zeros here. Let's show that the system still works with ones and zeros before we start adding things like 0.5s and 0.25s and other crazy things. Okay, so if p is zero, well, not p. I'm just going to not use the double brackets just to save some time. Um, so not p is going to be one minus p. Uh, that's how the definition works for not p as described in one. So this would be one minus zero, which is one. And according to our truth table, if P is zero, then not P should be one. So yeah, uh, these are the same. So this works, this is what we expect it to be. Okay, uh, what if we have P and Q? Uh, P is one and Q is false, or, or Q is zero. Well, we know that P and Q is going to be the minimum value of P and Q according to our definition, which means we want the smallest value of one and zero. So what's the smallest value of one and zero? That's just zero, because zero is the smaller one of the two. So when we take a look at our truth table for P, Q, and P and Q, if P is true and Q is false, uh, we know that P and Q is false. And if we compare the two values, uh, that's zero, that's zero, these are a match. This new system works the same as our old system. We get the same output. So uh, this seems to work, seems to be consistent with what we had. 
Okay, P or Q. Uh, how does this work? Now we're going to take the highest value of P and Q. Maximum of P and Q. So the maximum of 1 and 0 for this case. And that's going to be a 1. So if we compare it to our regular truth tables, P, Q, and P or Q, if that's a 1 and a 0, at least one of them is true, so P or Q will be true. So if we take a look at this, uh, these match, so this works. If we checked every single case, we would find that this works too, but I figured, uh, let's just check one case to show that this works. Okay, this last one, I had to do a little bit of thinking, and I kind of gave you a hint in the instructions uh, and said, oh, well, in the logic laws, there is a way that we can convert this to an or statement. And there's also a way if we think about the definition is if the antecedent is false or the consequent is true, then the conditional is true. So we can convert P arrow Q into not Q, sorry, not P or Q. So we can find this equivalent by thinking about it in a few different ways or by checking the logic laws. So what this means is that we can use the same definition. We can say this is going to be the maximum of not P and Q. And then we can sort of apply the same definition internally. So it gets a little bit more complicated here, but uh, not really much more complicated. So not P is just one minus P and then Q. So really we've just changed not P into one minus P. So when we plug our values in, we're taking the maximum of one minus P. So one minus one is zero. The value of Q is zero. So the maximum of zero and zero gives us zero. So um, if P is one and Q is zero, and we have the conditional, we get zero. And this is what we expect from the conditional. If P is true and Q is false, this is the only case in the conditional that comes out as false. So yeah, these match. This is what we expect. So with all of our basic operators, the, the, the arrow, the or, and the negation, this new system that we have for defining how we get truth values works with ones and zeros. So we could use our old truth table way, or we could use this new system, and it's going to be consistent. So let's just add some new numbers. Let's add this 0.5 to our system. And when people add 0.5, usually it means something like uncertain or indeterminate. So this could mean that you don't know what the value is, or maybe there's no value, it's undefined. Okay, so what would these values look like? Um, if P is 1, well, not P is going to be 1 minus P. So if P is 1, then not P is 0. In fact, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take uh, this dotted line and just sort of spread it along in these uh, three little sections here. Okay, so not P is going to be 0, 1 minus P. So 1 minus 1. If we do, if P is 0.5, uh, 1 minus 0.5, we're going to get 0.5 in all of these. So if P is 0.5 or uncertain, then not P is also uncertain. If you don't know P, you don't know not P. Um, but if P is false, then not P is still going to be true. So uh, the things that we're used to, P being true and P being false, uh, we still have the same values for not P that we would expect. Okay. Uh, P and Q. So remember with P and Q, we're taking the minimum of P and Q. We're taking the smallest value. So with P and Q both being 1, uh, we're going to get 1 there. Uh, P is 1 and Q is 0.5. Well, this is going to give us a 0.5 output. So it's uncertain. We know P is true, but Q is uncertain. So the best we can do here is that P and Q together are uncertain. Um, but if P is true and Q is false, we know P and Q is false. Okay, uh, for the next three, P is uncertain in every case. So the best we can do is uncertain. So if Q is true and P is uncertain, well, P and Q is uncertain. If P and Q are both uncertain, then yeah, P and Q is uncertain. But if Q is false, then we know P and Q is false. And in the last three rows, P is false in every case. So we know that P and Q will be false, since 0 is lower than whatever value we're going to give Q. OK, uh, P or Q, we're going to take the max value of P and Q. 
So in the first three rows, P is true. So one is gonna be our highest value here. So P or Q, this will be true in each case. Uh, in the fourth row, Q is one. And in the fifth and sixth row, P is uncertain. So this will be the highest value of 0.5. And in the seventh, eighth, and ninth row, uh, Q will be our higher value here. So Q is true in row seven, Q is uncertain in row eight, and P and Q are both false in row nine. So this is the value we end up with for um, P or Q. And now with P arrow Q, we're taking the maximum of not P and Q. So this is a little bit of work, but we can compare uh, these two columns here. So in the first row, uh, Q is true, so P arrow Q will be 1. Uh, in the second row, Q is 0.5, so we have an uncertainty here. Uh, in the third row, they're both false, so 1.5 and 0. Uh, in the fourth, fifth, and sixth row, uh, Q is true in the fourth row, so this will be true. And then in the fifth and sixth row, not P is 0.5, and this will be the highest value. So we're going to have a 0.5 output here. So these will both be uncertain. The antecedent is uncertain, so the conditional will be uncertain. Uh, and then for the seventh, eighth, and ninth row, the antecedent is true in this case. Well, not P is true in this case. It's the highest value. So all of these will be true. So, I mean, in this case, P is false, so the conditional will be true. So this is how our truth table will look like with 0.5s. And all of these 0.5s just mean uncertain. So this is a three-valued system, but we don't just need three-valued systems. We could also use crazy values like 0.37 or 0.21 or uh, even like, I don't know, pi minus 3 if we wanted to. Whatever that would mean. But if we use numbers like this, what do you think we could use them for? And there's a few things we could use them for. We could have a sentence like, he is tall. Now, a word like tall is a relative term, so, or a, a degree term or a relative term. So whenever you use adjectives that are relative to some other species or some other person, um, you know, you could say he is tall is a 0.7. And that could mean out of the population of people, you know, he's taller than 70% of everyone. Uh, maybe that's what 0.7 means. Or, um, you know, maybe if you say he is tall and you compare him to an elephant, you know, what does that mean? So uh, you could use a gradient truth value to describe these adjectives of degree. Uh, you could also do something for certainty or probability. So you could have a statement like, um, he will win. And yeah, this isn't something that's necessarily true or false until it happens. Uh, there's only a probability you can associate it with or a certainty or how much you believe that to be true. So in one circumstance, if it's something that someone's good at, you might say, yeah, there's a 0.8 chance that this will be true. But if you say the statement about someone who's not good at whatever they're about to compete in, it might be a lower value, like 0 0.2. So uh, we can use different systems of logic with different values in order to discuss different types of truth. So degree or certainty or probability. So these are just a couple things that we could use it for. So we're not quite doing that in this course, but uh, a nice little exploration problem of what we can do to propositional logic to extend it to cover a lot more ground uh, than what we've been able to do in this course. Now, uh, the second problem, the fourth problem, is interesting as well, because we talked about exclusive or in class, and we talked about it a little bit more from a uh, linguistic perspective, uh, from, you know, this... Uh, not presupposition, but from this implicature, where when you say you can have this or that, it's implied that you can only have one but not the other, and that you have to affirm it or deny it. 
But there's also a problem with it logically, with translation. So you can have exactly one of these three things. Well, exclusive or doesn't really work the best for translation, and uh, this is why. So first, you can have exactly one of an apple, an orange, or banana. Maybe we can translate this as A, X, or O, X, or B, uh, depending on which way you associate the brackets. So with this truth table, uh, it's zero if they're the same value, it's one if they're different values. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. A and O are the same, so it's false in the first two rows and false in the last two rows. A and O are the same in all of the other rows. Uh, zero or B, uh, they're the same in the first row, they're the same in the fourth row, they're the same in the fifth row, and the same in the last row, so those are all false, and they're different in the other rows. Okay, uh, for these other ones, if we take a look at these two rows, well, they're different in the first row, they're the same in the second row, they're the same in the third row, they're, diff uh, they're different in the fourth row, they're the same in the fifth row, they're different in the sixth row, different in the seventh row, and the same in the eighth row. So we get 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0. And if we compare uh, A with O or B, these two, we're going to end up with the same truth table for these two well-formed formulas. So we can switch the brackets around and the truth values don't change. Okay, so there's the truth table. Now, if someone were to have an apple, an orange, and a banana, and we consider this sentence, you can have exactly one of an apple, an orange, or a banana, and a banana, uh, what's the truth value of four? Well, it says we can have exactly one, so if we have all three, uh, it should be false. Because we can't have all three, we can only have exactly one. So four should be false. But if we take a look at the truth table, and this is what C is asking you to do, is to take a look at the truth table, what happens if we have all three? So let's just take a look at the first row. So the first row says, hey, we have all three. We have an apple, we have an orange, and we have a banana. So if we take a look at the well-formed formulas, it says it's true. If we have an apple, an orange, and a banana, it says it's true. So the truth table says it's true. But intuition says it's false. So do either the woofs, so do either of the well-formed formulas accurately represent the truth conditions of four? Uh, the answer is no. And why not? Well, because the truth table says it's true, but our intuition and understanding of the sentence says it's false. So the truth table gives an incorrect output for truth compared to what the sentence actually means. So there have been other ways to do this operator. Um, people have introduced like this choose operator. So in other words, you say things like, three choose one, and you apply it to three well-formed formulas like P, Q, and R. And then what you do is you say it's true if you have P, Q, and R, and one of them is true, and the other two are false. And if you have a situation where, say, uh, one is false and the other two are true, then you'd output a false. So like, there's new operators you can introduce that look at three well-formed formulas, or four or five, in order to, to work with this. Um, and these are abbreviations of much more complex formulas. So um, this is really an abbreviation of something much more complex. Okay, uh, so that's question four. Uh, question five, uh, you can just... Uh, I'll show you what the tree looked like for question five. You just have to use these rules here. So S goes to N, a VP, and then you just use the rules here. So this was a V bar to an N, a VDT to an N, and then your rules are here. So the VDT should look at triplets, the V bar should look at pairs, the VP should be looking for singletons. And I will leave feedback on your PDFs that you submitted. So, 
Uh, that's it for the assignment solutions. If you have any questions, as always, email me or post in the discussion board, and I'm happy uh, to explain things in more detail or have an appointment and go over things with you.